I'm so excited for this duel between Thorfinn and Thorkel. If I had to bet, I'm gonna give it to Thorfinn. <laughs> I like how we're just in the middle of a war and a rebellion and, you know, mutiny. All that can wait. It's just gonna wait for a duel between two crates. Forget Canute, you know, it doesn't matter. Friends, whatever. Damn. And this is subtly <laughs> Asclad's training, too, in a way. It's about the old block. I'd be more afraid of, like, getting grabbed on my ankle and flipped around like a ragdoll. He didn't talk much about his past. There just wasn't enough time. He was trying to spare Thorfinn that whole time. Even cooler. That's also an interesting parallel to Asclad, because Asclad is, you know, nobility, but it's kind of terrible. Thor's was nothing, but also the best. The greatest of everyone. <laughs> Look at how he's talking. <laughs> Damn, imagine saying that to Thorkel. <laughs> Thorfinn's made a career about people underestimating him, though. This is this tiny kid. Well, he's dead. Thorkel, the, the strongest person in this whole crowd, is giving him the most respect. <laughs> I feel like Thorkel's so out of his mind. He'd be happy to, like, die <laughs> to, to Thorfinn. I mean, whatever happens, we know one thing for sure. Someone is going to Valhalla. <laughs> How do you get to Avalon, though? That's my question. Avalon seems like the better deal. I just kind of hope that Thor Thorkel doesn't die, though. I would like him to be around forever. He's just so entertaining. <laughs> He's just so great. <laughs> Have some faith in your your son. Bjorn is just mushroom rampaging right now. Episode 18, Out of the Cradle. Knut seems like the kind of prince that actually would be okay working at his uncle's tea shop forever. Is that you, mommy? <laughs> there was a lot left unsaid between them. It's really sad comparing the, the hope Ragnar had with the inevitability of this happening. He, he can't predict, he could never predict, can you? It's just what the world is. The apples. That wasn't his sin. I mean, he did Canute a great thing. He actually gave him familial love. But in doing so, he sort of overprotected. It's so tough, and I don't even know familiar, familial relationships on this level. Like, I don't have kids, so I'm not going to pretend to understand it. But just in general, in relationships, there are certain circumstances where, as painful as it feels, you have to separate your love for the person from your relationship with the person, if that makes sense. Sometimes the relationship has things that don't serve one or the other party. For Ragnar, letting Canute go out into the world and experience it and learn and become the strong person that he has to be by necessity means sacrificing some of that safety he wants to create living in this kind of fantasy bubble and i think there's something about it that is like many things an, an attempt to try to regain a feeling of personal control in a chaotic world my mom told me a long time ago that when she was very young she couldn't imagine bringing kids into the world because she was convinced the world was a terrible and cruel place and she thought it would be a sin to bring other people into that. But here I am, right? And I'm uh, an autonomous human being with my own set of experiences and my own desire to live, my own will, my own interpretation of the world. Her preconceptions of me in that way did not allow for me, you know, it was all her. And while this may not apply for everyone, I'm incredibly grateful to be alive and for the opportunity to experience the world, even if it includes a lot of cruelty and terrible things and pain, tragedy. I'm tremendously grateful for the gift of life. I'm my own person and I believe I deserve that chance. You know, I deserve the chance to come to terms with it in my own way. That's such a fundamental and beautiful part of the human experience, you know, forging one's path through life. And Canute deserves that, that chance as well, no matter how well-intentioned Ragnar was. <laughs> you want to believe that this is actually Ragnar's spirit, you know, because he would have loved to have heard this. <laughs> but he knew. I mean, I want to believe he knew. And he felt the same. 
知ることがございますあなた様はすでにお気づきですよ私めのことは夢でございます Don't say that, Ragnar <laughs> But this is also Knut realizing Ragnar's love for him His love for Ragnar and Ragnar's love for him are deeply connected It's interesting that Dream Ragnar seems to have taken a step back there at the end and Go live your life And then fighting sounds in the distance <laughs> Woken up by Thorkel's grunts or Bjorn's grunts This is not what Ragnar wanted for him. <laughs> Oof. He's got a front row seat for the carnage. Just my delicate sensibilities. Is he talking to Knut or the booze? <laughs> Neither would surprise me. No, I just sit here and silently pass judgment. <laughs> this is such a weird contrast, such a clash of feelings, this emotional moment with just Bjorn tearing stuff up. God loves you. Love is war. So many crossovers suddenly. <laughs> you can cross this over with Kaguya-sama as well as Violet Evergarden. Drunk priest at your service. I will go wherever I am required. What is the meaning of love? The priest is not wrong in his passive criticism of Ragnar, but it's just a lot of different things at once. It's not one or the other. Ragnar did love him very much. It also perhaps wasn't the highest form of love in every decision. There was some selfishness in there. There was some willful blindness. That's just how it is. The existence of weaker elements in a loving relationship don't diminish the, the beautiful elements of it. <laughs> What happened to the Thagmir, or whatever his name was, the, the traitor, the main traitor? We got a hit in at least. It's also possible that Thorkel's just playing around because he's having a good time. This sounds familiar. What does it mean to be a warrior? And what does love mean? Contrasted side by side. This got really bleak all of a sudden. This is very different than what I expected from the priest and his outlook. I thought it was going to be some kind of, you know, God's universal love, not, you know, release and perfection and death. How dare you ask me a question? Interesting. Feeling love for Canute is discrimination. You are? <laughs> I'm struggling here. <laughs> Hold on a second. Whoa, hold on a second. If I really try to zoom out, I think that there's something to what the priest is saying. I just don't think that that's the full story. For reasons I can't explain. It's just like a hunch. I feel like the sum of everything that exists is beautiful, including all the terrible things. In a way, how could it not be? You know, how could everything that, that exists exist and be bad? It seems contradictory. And I think that there is kind of a mistake to looking at things we don't like and seeing them as separate from the whole. There's probably a reason for everything and existence and especially life is such a complex system that if 
something is tried and true and continues to exist, there's probably good reason for it. And perhaps the reason is that small sacrifices allow for greater potential. To look at it very generally, there's this concept of death and rebirth, right? And it seems clear that the death side of it is essential for the rebirth side of it. It's part of a healthy process of creation and growth. And I think there is some insight to be had in reflecting on that. And maybe there is some peace, some inner peace to be found from thinking about that in terms bigger than yourself. You know, anytime you're thinking about things that are beyond just your lens, you're hopefully expanding yourself to the point where you understand what you are better. But what you are is also an essential part of the equation, at least for me. What you want to be doing if you're trying to adopt a, a working model for thinking about existence is to be fully in line with the truth, not to be selective about what parts of the truth you like. It seems undeniable to me that part of that includes what is uniquely the human experience. And I think the human experience should not be denied in favor of some grander, way too zoomed out vision of the world that is detached from something essential to us, which is what we were made as and what we're geared towards. It's counterproductive to be denying an essential element of your own reality if your goal is to pursue reality, right? It's funny, I think this is one of the, the oldest things I've been saying on the channel, if not the oldest, starting with Midnight Gospel. There's this thing I'm not a huge fan of, which is kind of a denial, I feel, of humanity and the, the trials and tribulations and joys and pleasures and even very animalistic sides of what we are. But that's a part of the system too. It also has its place and there also is a reason for that. So I think when done well, this trying to look at the grand and universal seeks to harmonize both rather than treat our own humanity as if it's nothing or insignificant to us. Because it is, it's, it's what we are, it's all we are, at least where it comes to our experience. So the dead body, <laughs> I can see the beauty in the cycle of life element of it, the connectedness to nature, the humility even. But I also think that part of the greatness that exists in human potential has to do with choice, self-awareness, purpose, growing to be worthy of your name, Violet Evergarden style. What I suspect is that Vinland Saga already gave us answers in the form of Thor's. Thor's was very human and had very deep familial ties and bonds and love. But he also saw bigger than just his immediate needs and his selfish desires. And he saw sort of the whole at the same time. And now Carnage. Oh, that was pretty clever. Pretty slick. We don't know what it means to be a warrior, but we know it's not talking philosophy. Thorfinn hates that. Hmm, the connection. The connection to grandness. Yeah. It's tough to grasp. I feel like you can only get it in fleeting moments. But there also is love. It's all of those things. It's even bigger than he's thinking. Another way of looking at that is that it's it's just a price to pay for for knowledge, you know. You want to have the ability to abstract and think like a god. That gives you tremendous power for evil as well, you know, because you you become aware of other people's vulnerabilities too and their pain, and then you can choose to willingly exploit it. <laughs> that hawk was a great touch. <laughs> Hawk's like, what the hell is this dude doing up here? <laughs> Believe in your boy, your surrogate son. All in all, a successful trip. <laughs> I would move. I would leave. Yeah. He's just got all the way in. <laughs> He's just fully accepted. <laughs> We're all just snow. It's a really subtle distinction. I think it means that you have greater potential. There are more pitfalls, but more potential for greatness, for understanding. Whatever it's, whatever this philosophy is though, it's doing something for his confidence. This is like that stage one confidence where it gets you going. You can figure the rest out on the way. Yeah, let it all out, Bjorn. Yeah, 
Where is it going? Is, is it gonna... What? What is happening? You know it's serious when he drops the liquor. Sun's getting real low, <laughs> big boy, or whatever. <laughs> Why are we hugging? Alright, he'll, he'll be okay. Right, he'll be okay. He'll be alright. Well, he's taking action. He feels so assertive now. Damn. He went from sniveling whip to vassal commander in like five minutes. <laughs> Your battles have no meaning unless I tell you to battle. Only my battles. Look at this guy! Who, do, who the hell does he think he is all of a sudden? He gets one speech about the universe, and he's the creator of paradise. I like it though. <laughs> I don't agree with the whole thing. Like, I think there's a, an important distinction between the humility of seeing a bigger picture and indifference. You know, those are two very different things. But whatever gets him out of the sled in the morning and gets him commanding his vassals, I'm here for it. I think that when it comes to understanding the meaning of life, it's definitely a journey over destination thing. You're never going to grasp the fullness of God's world. I think you can get reflections of it for fleeting moments where you, for just one second or, or whatever, one moment in time, you're awestruck by the grandness in ways you can't even fully articulate and you can't hold on to it because it's too big. But there's definitely a direction, you know, you can go closer to to truth or farther away from truth even if you never will get to absolute full objective truth and there's something almost scientific about it you know you posit something like this is the meaning of life this is what existence is and then you try to test that out you try to live your life and see does living along those principles and those beliefs make the most out of what you can be what do you do when you run into obvious contradictions to your outlook do you you know just bury your head in the sand do you incorporate them do you get closer and closer to the truth how in line can you get with the current of reality how much can you fall into its momentum rather than trying to swim upstream. But this is a hell of a lot better for Knut and feels really good to see that he's found something to believe in at least. You know, something that drives him forward. It's going to be really interesting. I can't wait to see where he ends up falling as a result of all this. I'm not even sure it'll be good. It just depends on how deeply he goes, how open he is to other things as he experiences.